the Congo is found in the lower basin of the Zaire towards the Atlantic in what is now parts of both the Democratic Republic of Congo and Angola. Dr. Innocent Pikarai, Zimbabwean historian and archaeologist. Professor Suundula believes that the early origins of the Congo take us back 4,000 years. But how was the transition made from a Stone Age Bantu society made up of different groups to an Iron Age state with a strong ruler presiding over an extensive territory through an intricate web of alliances? Toute cette période de transition entre le néolithique et euh, l'apparition donc du, du fer et l'évolution all this period of transition from the Neolithic or Stone Age through to the Iron Age in 2nd century AD and on to the 13th and 14th centuries, during this period, there is a great vacuum. I've been researching graves in Soyo, in Banza Soyo. I've been researching south of Luanda, and yes, we have found things from the 9th century, but we haven't found anything much. The archaeological finds are just not telling us much. Professor Simao Suindula from Libreville, Gabon, where he works at the International Center for Bantu Civilizations. The Kingdom of Congo, next one, existed around the 14th century to the 17th century. Although the region was uh, still retained a name through the uh, uh, early 20th century, as you can see, the, the, the Congo with K and Congo of C is uh, kind of the same place. So in the 14th century, uh, two Bantu kingdoms joined together and formed the Con Kingdom of Congo. By the 15th century, Congo grew to about 2 million people. The people of Congo gathered bananas, coconuts, dates, and citrus fruits from the forest and they made oil, wine, vinegar, and bread from the palm trees. Uh, kind of give you some idea of their economic uh, uh, activities. Um, the Co Congo capital uh, is called the city of Mubanza. It is built on a plateau 50 miles south of the mouth of the Congo River. Uh, most people in this area lived in simple straw huts. Uh, the people of Congo used uh, shells for money, as you can see on the left picture. They made iron goods, copperware, pottery, and and different cloth. Um, they hunted for elephants for ivory. Once again, ivory is going to play a very important role to trade with other African kingdom. As you can see in the middle picture there, you see the ivory tusks, which is basically you know, from the elephant. Then, in the late 15th century, something happened which signaled a revolution in the volume of historical information available to future generations. It all began with a medieval European adventurer called Diego Cao, landing at the mouth of the river Zaire in 1482. Donc lorsque euh, l'équipage euh, du portugais Diego Cao arrive à cause donc dans les when the Portuguese adventurer Diego Cao arrived at the mouth of the Zaire River in 1482 with his crew, he came up against an organized political system with a common language. They asked for a meeting with the local ruler from the people they met. These were the Soyo, and they told Diego Cao that the big ruler lived 500 kilometers in the interior in his capital, Banza Congo, which is today in the Zaire province of Angola. Uh, Portuguese missionaries uh, in the 16th century, King John II of Portugal sent Jesuit missionaries to the Kingdom of Congo. The King of Congo converted to Christianity himself. By, the sev by 1576, Portuguese traders and missionaries had spread throughout the kingdom. Portuguese influence moved up the Congo River south to present day, what's called uh, Luanda, Angola, reaching as far as modern day Nab Nambibia. We hear the voice of the Mani Congo, the king of the Congo himself, speaking directly to us across the centuries in a unique set of letters between him and the king of Portugal. Writing here on October the 5th, 1514, from his palace in Mbanza, Congo. Very high and powerful prince, we Dom Afonso, by the grace of God, King of the Congo and Lord of the Ambundu, recommend ourselves to your highness as a king which we love very much. 
We want you to know that we are already Christians. Once the opening formalities were over, King Afonso set about unburdening himself, particularly his irritation with a Portuguese merchant called Fernão de Melo. He sold our goods at the lowest price possible. With the money, he bought a slave from Gore and another. He sent us them in one of the first ships, saying they were the carpenters. At the same time, he sent us some blue cloth, all gnawed by rats. The Portuguese, for their part, were amazed at the extreme piety exhibited by the young King Afonso when he had come to Portugal the previous year. So impressed was a Franciscan missionary, Rui d'Aguia, that he felt obliged to write to the Pope. It seems to me from the way he speaks that he's not a man, but rather an angel, sent by the Lord into this kingdom to convert it. For I assure you, it is he who instructs us. He devotes himself entirely to study, so it often happens he falls asleep over his books, and often he forgets to eat and drink in talking of the sins of our Lord. Um, the Portuguese wanted to make uh, more money, um, so they were they were getting involved with the slave business, uh, and then they, they wanted more slaves than was available. So they began supplying guns to different villagers to start civil wars. At this time, King Alfonso I wrote to King John asking him to stop the slave trade, because some kings realized this is getting bad, this is pretty bad here. Sir, there is in our kingdom a great obstacle to God. Many of our subjects crave the Portuguese merchandise which your people bring to our kingdom so keenly. In order to satisfy their crazy appetite, they snatch our free subjects. They even take our noblemen and sons of noblemen, even our kinsmen. They sell them to white men who are in our kingdom after having transported their prisoners on the sly in the dead of night. Then they are branded. The white men allege that they have bought them but they cannot say from whom. You were talking about earlier that there are certain African leaders at the time that mm -hmm. we should pay more attention to and, and talk about. Mm -hmm. Who were some of the African leaders who stood up at the time um, as people who were saying basically, no, this, this can't happen? I mean, I suppose two or three uh, figures come to mind and if we deal with them in terms of the earliest kind of peers King Afonso of the Congo I mean we shouldn't use that name because that's the name given to him by the Portuguese that he might have adopted yes. his name was, wasn't King Afonso but anyway let's use that that's yes. what he's known as to history as but he w came to the throne in the Congo what around early uh, 16th century but he wrote and he was literate he wrote a number of letters which still exist protesting at the slave trade Afonso I appealed to the Port Portuguese to stop trading with his African rivals because, quote, he said, merchants are taking every day our natives, sons of the land and sons of our noblemen and vassals, and our relatives because the African thieves and men of bad conscience grabbed them wishing to have the things and wares of this kingdom. So great, sir, is the corruption and licen licentiousness that our country is being completely depopulated. It is our will that in these kingdoms there should not be any trade of slaves nor outlet for them. Instead, in 1540, uh, instead of listening to uh, uh, request of King Alfonso I, King John sent more guns. And that eventually leads to the collapse of the Kingdom of Congo. Neighboring kingdoms, which had once formed as network of alliances, began to form their own unilateral treaties with the Portuguese and the exodus of men and women across the Atlantic to service the slave plantations of the Americas proceeded relentlessly, reducing the equatorial basin in parts to a wasteland. The year is 1526. The charmed relationship between the Bakongo and the Portuguese is drowning in a tide of greed and cruelty and the trade in slaves, which had originally given the money Congo the purchasing power to buy foreign goods, is now increasingly out of his control, and worse, robbing the kingdom of its best men. The money Congo, King Afonso I, is unhappy. The other person who comes to mind, within the same kind of 
region is of course Queen Nzinga. She in fact of course comes to power in Ndongo. And uh, in some ways we need to locate her in the kind of the kind of destabilization of the Congo because Queen Nzinga's kingdom was in first, was initially a tributary kingdom to the Congo. That the Portuguese encourage it to break away. <laughs> she comes to power in the destabilization that takes place in the 1620s, uh, rough, roughly 1624. Uh, uh, and for 30 years or so, she leads a campaign against the slave trade. And it's really only with her death that the situation is in fact created whereby the Portuguese can in fact now, as it were, install their own puppet leaders in some of these places. So Queen Nzinga, I think, is a significant kind of figure. She's a powerful figure. She, too, again, was literate. A number of her letters survive. And I would, of course, encourage listeners to really get into this kind of literature. It's up to us to make that available. Yes. You now, those written by King Afonso, by Queen Nzinga. And, of course... Queen Nzinga, her father prepared her to be the woman and the leader that she was. She was stronger than her brother who preceded her. Now she was a very, very skilled diplomat. What's interesting about her, for example, you have this one group called the Jaga, J-A-G-A, -A, marauders. They are mercenaries, essentially, all right? But she was able to form an alliance with the Jaga to, to challenge those Africans who, were, who, who fought on the side of the Portuguese and also to challenge the Portuguese. Now she went to them in uh, 1622 and said, hey, let's make a peace treaty. I'll give you back your captives. You leave uh, Ndongo. You leave Matamba. They said, yeah, okay. And then this is true now. I'm not, they said, yes. They said, okay, this is what we're gonna do. She turned her back, they attacked. This is 1622, and some 30-something years later, because of all of her effort, they ended up signing that very same peace treaty. All right, this is uh, from, from 30 years, uh, well, I guess 44 years before. Right. And uh, during this time, especially throughout the whole of the 1940s, Queen Nzinga led her troops in battle. She didn't sit back comfortably somewhere and await reports. She led them into battle over again when they were in situations where they knew they weren't going to prevail. She came up with, with ways to enable them to escape. And, and the victories that they won where they prevailed, she led them in, in battles. When they needed to form new alliances, she's the one who went out and got the new alliances. She's the one who formed the alliances with the Dutch to acquire weaponry, rep weaponry to, to challenge the, 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 the Portuguese. Finally, in 1665, the army of the Congo sustained a decisive defeat at the hands of the Portuguese, and Congo became just one of a number of small states dependent on the Portuguese, whose ruling class quaintly maintained the titles of the Portuguese aristocracy. The arrival of the Portuguese signaled the end of one of the biggest equatorial states in Africa. It signaled a grave disruption to African control of trade routes leading outside the continent. And the political life of the continent reflected this. I think the problem started when the relationship between Portugal and Congo started to be looked at largely in terms of the slave trade and it degenerated into a relationship of unequals. Uh, Portugal was even questioning the right of, of Congo to send ambassador now, and increasingly looking at Congo as, as really a colony, uh, and not a sovereign state. Professor Bethwell Ogot of Maseno University in Kenya. On the 2nd of July, 1706, in Mbamza, Congo, the city of the Congo Kingdom, a 22-year-old young woman was burned alive for the revolution against slavery. Her name is Kimpa Vita, the mother of the African Revolution. It's like that I see a young woman, audacious, courageous, who uh, uh, sacrificed for her ideas, for her people, and who was a kind of port of the liberty of the African people. It's very modern, in fact. The image of Kimpa Vita is very modern. Parce qu'encore une fois, je dirais que chaque génération 
Il y aura toujours des personnes qui vont dénoncer les injustices. Il y aura toujours des personnes qui vont se dire, tiens, un autre, un autre monde est, est, est possible. Kim Pavica, je pense qu'elle a compris qu'en en fait, il fallait euh, ne plus accepter la condition euh, des Noirs dans son pays et donc de se révolter quelque part. Et euh, ce qui était très important aussi pour moi, c'est montrer aussi qu'en règle générale, souvent, euh, le changement de société euh, provient aussi des jeunes. Euh, parce que quand elle a pris conscience qu'elle pouvait justement euh, mettre en question la société dans laquelle elle était, elle était assez jeune. Et donc elle a créé ce mouvement euh, derrière elle pour dire « voilà, soyez fiers de ce que vous êtes, soyez fiers euh, de la couleur que vous avez ».